Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Reinsurance Podcast. I am your co-host, Jared Lee. And I'm Ben Rose. How are you doing, everybody? Welcome to August. Welcome to our August News Roundup, our, one of our favorite episodes each month. And August did not disappoint this month. So um, I think what we're going to do, we've not, we've not spent a bunch of time in the news previously, like diving into losses, but August felt like there's a lot going on as as sort of summer renewals are wrapping up, there's a, a litany of, of claims sort of happening around the industry. Um, the month kicking off with uh, sort of the New Zealand flood updates, that's more than 2 billion now. Um, the Turkish earthquakes, lest we forget, in the beginning part of the month as well, now north of 5 billion. Um, and, so, and Swiss Re's come out saying more than 70% of cat losses in the first half of the year um, were from sort of severe conductive storms. So it's just an accelerated number than what we've seen in, in previous years there. So obviously some climate change having any impact on that part of, of the loss. And it's not it's not just looking backwards as well, but also looking presently, I was going to say forwards, looking right now, uh, it does seem like there's plenty of other things going on. Although I would say in general, unclear at this stage how much is going to be affecting the reinsurance markets. I, so most of the world is on fire, it seems, or has been lately. There have been some really tragic wildfires I, in Hawaii, we've seen most recently, but right now also bits of Canada on fire. Greece is getting ready to catch fire again, and it's spreading to Turkey. I, again, not to sort of wave the global warming flag too much, it does feel like we're going through an alarmingly intense period of, of global wildfire activity. Uh, and not helped by how windy it seems to be getting everywhere too. So even uh, this month, we saw the first uh, tropical storm make landfall uh, in California in 84 years. Uh, the last one being, you know, in, in the memory of the eldest amongst that local population alone. Uh, so again, unclear how much hurricane coverage or wildfire coverage there will be in the various locations affected, but new new perils, new regions popping up uh, ever more frequently than we might expect. So reinsurers will be watching out for attritional uh, or unexpected losses uh, in all of their regions, I guess. Yeah. Well, and you're combining that kind of, you have the hardening market, which we're, we'll touch on here in a second with premium coming in, but the sort of the size of the risk exposure seems to be increasing, right? You're Greece being hit twice potentially with severe wildfires, Canada for the you know several consecutive years of severe wildfires there. And then as you're saying, perils that normally don't hit regions now emerging like once in 84 years, but you know, is this going to be a one every five years position now? Like in the way we've seen sort of one in a hundred year events happening in Florida every three years, it seems like. It, we won to watch and as the as pricing is beginning to sort of stabilize now and that's what the perception is after one seven or seven one uh, for the American audience um, it'll be interesting to see how these things play off each other um, but let's jump into the capital side of the equation then so uh, we saw a record ILS issuance in the first half of this year um, so Swiss Re sort of pointing out what that's looking like and it it seems like we'll pushed north of 100 billion for the first time in third party capital so that's um that's super interesting um yeah. and then oh, go ahead yeah I, I mean i was going to just say in, in general i think people are, are keen to uh, jump on the back of the rate increases that we're seeing as well and also spurred on perhaps by the finding that some of the prior year uh, incidents like, like the hurricane ian losses for example have not really touched some of those cat bomb structures as much as people initially feared. Uh, so whereas a muted response was initially expected, perhaps following, you know, yet more uh, nat, nat cat activity, we've actually seen encouraging signs that suggest piling into nat cat risk might not be uh, as, as risky as people thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you're seeing the the sort of traditional players, again, showing resilience there. So the top five reinsurers um, sort of in, amid inflation measures are expecting capital to rebound rebound to 2021 levels. So again, there was a little bit of a dip and there was a concern or a question around with rising interest rates and in the sort of macro environment, would capital go elsewhere? 
it looks like we're going to sort of move back to what we saw in 2021 and then probably grow from there. So capital across the space has been increasing since 2012, besides the dip um, last year in the beginning part of this year. So if we sort of return to that trend in 2024, that should be a good signal for those looking to get protection and coverage in the market. I think what's interesting here is, is that, you know, we're, we're sat with, uh, you know, GC's prop cat index showing big price rises, 28% year on year, biggest surge since 2006. Uh, and that has spurred presumably some of the activity on the alternative capital side of things. But AM Best came out this month saying that they, they still don't think this is enough to spur on a, a class of 2023. Uh, so we'll be watching this space going into you know the major reinsurance conferences coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, but same same folks on the traditional reinsurance side, but but getting bigger uh, and and piling on the premium and the capacity. Yeah, and it'll be interesting. There's a there's a few smaller reinsurers that have spun up, but it, uh, perhaps they're not sufficiently capitalized to then justify like this lens that this is the new class of, of 2023 or similar so but yeah it's certainly one that will be an interesting uh piece for us to watch uh shifting gears a little bit then um gartner came out this week uh they had done a survey of sort of 250 senior enterprise executives and one of the findings of this survey was ai is now in the top five emerging risks um, for for the biggest concerns that executives have. And if you look across this, this top five list, you have third-party viability, um, uh, mass generative AI availability, and then cloud concentration risk is three of those five. It's a really interesting shift as we recognize the importance in, of technology and, and how these organizations operate and the complexity of risk that this, the executives realize as they try to navigate um, and protect the businesses against something going awry there. Yeah, and I think it, it mirrors, I guess, the expectations of the market that one day, you know, cyber will be the dominant class of business as, as people start to think about, you know, what's left that isn't digital uh, as we ever more align all of our, our sort of industries and ecosystems and economies around more of an online way of doing things. Uh, but I think we'll, we'll see how quickly uh, as is often not the case, uh, the insurance and reinsurance markets are able to respond to uh, the potential demand for un underinsured or not at all insured risks, uh, such as those mentioned in that Gartner survey. So we'll we'll watch that space eagerly. Yeah, and and it, you're you're spot on. I think when we when we look at this transition, it feels similar in many ways to that chart that shows like the biggest firms in the world 25 years ago, which is all oil and banking and, you know, tele, uh, telecommunications and things. And now how all of those are technology firms, it feels like we'll see a similar transition in the risk space, or at least the, the concerns people have, but you're spot on that the industry has struggled in many ways to be delivering products that are perfectly aligned with the needs of the consumers there. So the AN reports of the last few years around the biggest concerns executive have executives have is always focused on the gaps in protection there rather than the litany of products that we're now deploying to protect these clients. So I mean, interesting one. Yeah, perhaps it is in fact to the industry's credit that uh, the existing set of risks that we know best are not on the top of executives' mind because they are sufficiently reinsured that their reliable insurance and reinsurance products will protect them, and therefore fire and uh, all risks, perils <laughs> of uh, out of sight and out of mind, and, and all sorted thanks to their their great insurance partners. That, that's actually an excellent point. So uh, let's we'll end that we'll end that segment on a high with, with the, of, <laughs> of the market. Yeah, this story uh, had a happy end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Unlike this story, which is uh, the the updates on the Vestu sort of saga as we as we see it now, um, it was a story we first covered at the end of last month's uh, news roundup, where it was the emergence of potentially um, fraudulent uh, LOCs as part of uh, the issuance of capital that has come out of Vestu. 
Bastu in these states in the U.S. has uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Uh, the other day, they also filed for protection in Israel. Um, there's some lawsuits from Aon and, and the Bermudan Monetary Authority coming out. So seems like that's progressing quite rapidly and in not in a not in a way that makes me feel happy ending is looming in unlike your your last comment. Yeah, indeed. And I think we will continue to track this one throughout with changes coming in almost daily, really, as, as I think the latest being announcements around Vestu trying to include various cells of White Rock in, in its bankruptcy projection. So this is going to be an a saga I, I'm sure will be really interesting for people to watch and learn from uh, as we think about, you know, the ultimate ability of our industry to pay claims when they're, they're due and, and to make sure that collateral is there and is callable when needed. Uh, it's a, a really interesting case study, obviously not a desirable one, but hopefully one that the industry will take some some good learnings from. Yeah, well, and if, if we circle back and, and we look at the, the other times we've had significant moments of distrust, if you'll put it that way, in the industry, you look at like the Lloyd's um, events from so that's 30 years ago now. Um, this feels like a similar kind of shift. What you're going to have out the back of this is a renewed focus on the details of some of these contracts, a, a doubling down on the due diligence that's required and the evidencing that's required before these things get issued. And, like I think the industry will come back collectively much more resilient and protected against this ever happening in the future. But events like this are certainly the ones that sort of shine the spotlight on where there potentially were gaps that will probably no longer exist. And this is probably unlikely to happen at least in the next sort of couple decades or more. So yeah, an interesting one to end our news roundup. And I'm sure one will probably have an update on again at the end of September um, as we come out of conference season and things. But conference season is now in front of us. You said looking back, but also forward. We've got Baden-Baden, Monte Carlo, Cirque, SIRC, and uh, everything coming up here. So that's an exciting few, few weeks going into September. Yes, indeed. Look out for us if you are going to Monte Carlo. I, I hear rumors of potentially even a, a flag somewhere indicating our whereabouts, but I'm sure that will all emerge on socials soon and we'll see you in in Monte Carlo in in real life hopefully and online and on video uh, very very soon uh, afterwards as well with our next monthly reinsurance podcast update and stay tuned for the next reinsurance podcast thanks everyone see you soon <laughs>